Over the past few weeks, you've heard about our Kindle the Fire campaign, the campaign that makes or breaks continuing our Catholic mission in the coming year. Time is running out for us to reach our challenge grant and have your donation count twice. That's right. There is precious little time left to have your tax-deductible donation matched up to $65,000 before December 9th, whether by credit card, PayPal, check, or even stock. Every dollar donated will double in value, so every little bit helps. Be doers of the word, says St. James, and not hearers only. By your generous support, you too can become an integral part of the ongoing production of this podcast and of all our expanded audio offerings. Help us kindle the fire. Please visit catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio to donate now. That's catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Thank you, and please pray that all of us here remain worthy of your trust. Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, an offering to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas B. Miras. And this podcast is a production of catholicculture.org. Hey everybody, my guest today will be known to many of you, so I'll keep my intro short. Anthony Esselin is a well-known cultural commentator, translator of poetry, and uh, professor of literature now at Magdalen College in New Hampshire. In this interview, we'll be discussing a new stage in his career because Ignatius Press has just published his first book of original poetry. In fact, it is a book-length poem titled The Hundredfold Songs for the Lord. Tony Eslin, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Well, thank you, Tom. It's great to be here. I've been familiar with your stuff, your writing for a while, and when I heard, I think a couple years ago, saw you mentioned somewhere that you were working on a book of poems. I was very excited. Everybody knows that you are an astute cultural commentator in many ways. And when you have the mind to, you can really uh, tear apart modern culture in a a very effective way and, and very eloquently. But my favorite work of yours has always been when you're singing the praises of something or talking about something that you love. The point I'm getting to is that, you know, there's nothing more sort of constructive, you know, in terms of uh, cultural activity than actually making something. And that's what you've done here. It seems to be the culmination of a long journey for you. So everybody knows you've you've translated the Divine Comedy, you've translated uh, Tasso. So you have a lot of experience with verse. But what's your background right. with writing your own poems? Oh, well, it's what I used to do as the main thing that I wrote. This would be a long time ago now, maybe 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And I think I ran out of steam. I began instead to turn that side of me towards the translating of of epic works that I thought had not been translated well enough. The first one was Lucretius's On the Nature of Things. And I did this, by the way, not because it was a worthy thing to do, but I need to get my promotions as a professor. I had a family to support. Um, Then came Tasso's Jerusalem Delivered, and and then came the Divine Comedy. But I think you're right that at least I enjoy, more than anything else, writing about things that I love, things that are beautiful. It, It brings out the teacher in me. The fundamental feature of any teacher, I think, any good teacher, is that you see something that is fascinating or wondrous or beautiful or good or true, and you want to show people that thing. Say, hey, look at this. Look at this. I mean, that's a, it's a lot more fun to do that kind of thing than to write about the, the miseries of our, of our current culture. So when I finally got some free time again a few years ago, I said, you know, I, I'm going to try my hand at poetry all over again. I have a lot in, under my belt now in the last 25 years, a lot of experience, a lot of reading. And some ex- considerable experience writing verse, though though not my own verse, translation. I try my hand at it because it's the kind of thing that needs to be done. And let's see what happens. So that was the beginning of the 
the thing that is now made manifest in, in this book of poems, which is one big poem. It's one single poem made up of 101 different poems of various sorts, and they all have to do with Christ, the, with the life of Christ, persons who knew Christ, hymns to, to God, and in some of the poems, what it is like for a Christian to be alive right now. Though most of the poem, the whole thing, most of the whole thing is set during the, the, the time of Christ and shortly after. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you didn't just start writing a few little lyric poems. Uh, you you jumped right into the deep end with this with this project. I guess that makes sense in a in a, in a way since that's the the material that you've been honing your craft on uh, as a translator. Yeah, it, it's what the medieval and Renaissance poets and artists in other in other genres. It's what they did. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this sort of thing again, it's not just going to be a poem here and a poem there. I want to make something which is one coherent and complete work. And I want to do it in a kind of way that would have made sense to poets like Petrarch and Spencer and Dante himself. And so that's what we've got here in, in the hundredfold. And, you know, the title indicates that there is sort of a, it, it's not merely sort of biblical illusion. There actually is a numerology to it of a uh, hundred poems, I believe. A hundred yeah, and one. I can't yeah. explain or or even begin to remember all of the details that you explained about the structure of the piece in your, your introduction. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the architecture of the whole thing. I'll tell a little bit, and I, I can say that for all that I said in the introduction, I also mentioned that there were other things I had done that I wasn't going to put in the introduction. I'll let uh, curious and attentive readers discover them for themselves. So the, the, the whole work is made up of three different kinds of poems. The, the big pillars of the work, are, there are 12 of them, are uh, long dramatic monologues or dialogues or letters written in iambic pentameter that is not rhymed, so that, that is blank verse. It is not free verse, I don't do free verse. This is blank verse, unrhymed iambic pentameter. Um, that's the verse that, that that's, the, the, that's the form, that's the metrical form in which most of the really great poetry in English, that is long poetry, long poems, are written. So I've, I've adopted that. Those are all, those monologues all come from the life of Christ and the decades after. And the first one, for instance, is spoken by Mary. Christ is a grown man. Um, Joseph has passed away. Christ has not begun his public ministry yet, but it seems he's on the verge of doing so. And Mary is considering him early one morning as he lies asleep. And naturally, she is worried, as a, as a mother would be. And the final one, a couple of disciples keeping watch over the bedside of St. John who they believe is dying, is about to die. And this brings us to the uh, end of the New Testament, and the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. St. Peter is in there, the, the night of his denial of Christ. It's a pretty um, overwhelming piece. Right. This is before the resurrection. What would he say? How would he introduce himself? What would he think as he was weak? So, so these are the, 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 there are 12 of them, and they're the big pillars. And there are 21 hymns. And uh, what I said, I asked myself when I was writing the hymns was this, is it possible in English right now to write strong hymns such as people wrote in English and other languages for Christian services for the Catholic mass for 2000 years? Is it possible to do that without torturing the, the word order, without, you know, larding everything up with archaic words? Just using for convenience, and it is extremely convenient. Use I allow myself to use thee and thine, which are irreplaceable, I think. But otherwise, no. Otherwise, simply our language right now. Is that possible? And I think the answer is yes. I've written 21 of them, and they're interspersed in particular order throughout the work. So the, the 12 dramatic monologues and the, and the 21 hymns make 33, which is the number for for Jesus, the number of uh, years of his life tradition. And then interspersed among these are 67 lyric poems. Uh, most of them are quite short, many of them only 10 lines long. Some of them are much longer. All of them are headed by a verse from scripture. And these poems 
they sometimes deal with the life of Christ, but they sometimes deal with our world now. And in them, sometimes I speak from my own personal words. And that would make 100. And the whole thing is ended then by a 100 line long farewell poem in Dante's Terzari, where I am, in fact, speaking in my words. I mean, that's how it's constructed. And uh, everything is in a particular place exactly where I want it to be so that the whole thing makes sense on many levels as as not just a set of poems but as a whole work though it, it you can dip into it at any point without without uh, without harm without or i mean you can open the book at random and say i'm just going to read a couple of poems from the middle and it would be you would it would be perfectly fine and perfectly capable of doing that i want to be read and i hope that ordinary people will do that why don't you uh, read us one of those short pieces now? I was thinking, could you read number 22? And each of these lyrics is sort of titled with a verse of scripture. Right. This is rather an unusual one. Number 22 is. Its verse is from St. Paul. For strength is made perfect in weakness. And here uh, I am speaking in my own voice again. This is a seven-line poem that's on purpose uh, with uh, seven beats to each line. So this is an unusual form. It's heptameter. Open my wound, O gentle surgeon, and probe where the old thorn has lodged and leached its gall into my blood. Sin bred, sin born, am I. And with the sweet sap of my youth, its roots snaked down, tangling the tender flesh, half strangling, till I seem half grown into its alien tree. Let not a twig or bud be torn. Drain off the poison with a kiss. Wash my blood with thine own, that from my crimson blossoms may be wreathed at last crown. There I am pleading with God. Uh, I can't save myself. I'm, I can't heal myself. Uh, I need to be healed, so... So there's there's this wound that's unhealed. Open it up, surgeon. And don't be over gentle with it. It needs healing. Well, open that thing up. There's sin like a thorn that's lodged itself way down there. Cut away. Cut away freely. Get that thing out. It's tangled itself into my very being. Uh, half measures won't do here. Little salve on the top of it won't do. Some radical surgery is needed. Well, oh, gentle surgeon, go to work. Do do whatever needs to be done. That's a little bit of a poem, that one. Uh, what struck me about that particular poem was the image of the sin kind of entwining itself with with your nature to the degree that, you know, sometimes as sometimes we mistake the voice of the devil for our own thoughts, we become so dominated, you know, by those things in the same way, you know, we may mistake our sins, or if not our sins, the effect of our sins, the effect or the effect of a flawed upbringing for our own personality. And and we just, we really are, are blind to what is us as God wanted us to be and what isn't. Even aside from things, the, the, from actions, you know, that, that we can say are sinful or not sinful, just, just the, the way that we are on a base level. Yeah. And then we take that for our identity. When it isn't our identity at all, it's a kind of neither flesh nor fowl, a, a, a sort of half human thing. It's us, but it's also a parody of us. It's not really us. So I've got another poem I'd like to read here that would bring us closer oh, please, yeah. to what we maybe ought to be. And this would be number 16 on page 82. And this is, I, I want to read this because it's sweeter than, than what I just read. It asks for the same result, but now it asks for it as a return to boyhood, a return to innocence. And I had this one be a lyric right before a long monologue. I imagined, okay, that boy who had um, some loaves and fishes when Jesus multiplied the loaves and fishes, whoever that boy was, maybe he got old someday and had grandchildren. What would it be like to be grandpa looking back upon that day? So this, this particular little poem precedes the monologue that's headed with the words, the boy who brought some food. But uh, now this one has its heading, a verse from scripture, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. 
So, lead me, O Lord, into the world I knew, when water was a wondrous thing like wine, and manna no more marvelous than the dew globed on the grapes of my grandfather's vine. The little stars were mine, because they were themselves and came from you, and the dogs barked because you made them to. Then take me, Lord, into that world to come, where nations are a drop in a child's pail, and all their wars a pat upon his drum. Bring me where living waters never fail, and the dog wags his tail, because the prodigal at last is home, and has an endless riverside to roam. I say to people, you know, you don't have to be an expert in poetry or literature to read that. You don't have to be. You shouldn't have to be. Poetry is really for, for everybody. It's unfortunate that in our time, it's been so ruined by, well, by a lot of poets themselves, but by academics, so that nobody thinks anymore that poetry is a part of their lives. It used to be part of everybody's life in some fashion. Hmm, yeah. Now, this is an extremely readable book. I mean, anybody who can read your columns can read this book. Well, thank you. That's, that's what I intend. And really, I do mean this as a fact. Wherever you went, we're the strange ones here, wherever you went in human history, doesn't matter where you go, you go in some place where they don't have paint, so painting is not an art there, right? Or they don't have stone that they can carve, so sculpture is not an art there. Wherever you go, you had song, and song was always in the form of poetry, and it was passed down from one generation to the next. It was part of what made them a people. You bound you together with your neighbors bound you together with generations past. That's a universal in human experience until us, right? So I'm, I did this to bring back into the minds of, of Catholics and Christians generally that, you know, we ought to reclaim this art. It doesn't belong to the academics. It should belong to us. And we can reclaim it, reclaim it for Christ. We can write poetry that people will enjoy. Right. I mean, quite aside from the question whether it's good or great or very good, whatever. I mean, the generations will have to decide that. But merely to be read uh, or to sing, that's universal or should be universal among humans. This was a call to return to to nature, to human nature. So, yeah. How do you graft yourself onto a uh... A lost tradition. Now, obviously, there are other formalists in the 20th century, and there are a number of rather good ones, you know, Catholic formalist poets now, like James Matthew Wilson, who I know you know. But I know that that was part, as you said in the introduction of your book, and I should say you, you for the listeners, there's a lengthy introduction, which is mostly about sort of poetry in general, but then goes into an explanation of the the sort of structure and purpose of the work itself. And at the very end, you say, you know, it's basically you're trying to just make a start. You say it very modestly. I think you've, you've done something, you know, very impressive and beautiful. But what's the process for someone who, you know, can't learn this in school exactly? Huh. You're not going to learn it in school because poetry has been almost entirely abandoned. And that at all levels, too. If you are a graduate student in most English departments in the United States, you probably will not be reading a whole lot of poetry, very little. What's the process? The process is, well, I hope we have classical Christian schools out there and teachers that will keep in mind that you really do deliver quite a lot of power and beauty with poetry on the cheap, so to speak. You don't have to read a 500-page novel, often just a, a poem that takes up a single page and can be read in two minutes and uh, be with somebody for the rest of their lives, right? I mean, it's a ridiculous thing to, to neglect this art, but mostly it is neglected. Well, if it's been neglected, then... Uh, in your own education, then you know you, you've got some, yeah, you've got some relearning to do. I can recommend a couple of pretty good books that'll help you out if you know a lot of English poetry and you want to, it, you you know you want to, in your own writing, you want to continue the heritage. Well, pay then pay close attention to the poets of old. What did they do? Okay, especially what did they do that no longer is done. And here I'm not just mm -hmm. talking about quality. I'm talking about kinds of poems. 
that are no longer written at all. Dramatic monologues, for instance, they were hugely popular in the 19th century in English. Robert Browning, uh, I mean, that's, that's what we remember him for, his dramatic monologues. Tennyson was much the same way. Tennyson wrote a lot of phenomenal dramatic monologues. Robert Frost was still writing them. After Frost, they seemed to disappear. Why? It was a great, great form of art. Why did they disappear? I don't know. But there are other kinds of poems that have disappeared. Songs have disappeared. Poets used to write a lot of hymns. Who's been writing hymns lately? People who don't know what they're doing, mostly. Pay attention to what the old masters did and how they did it. This is going to take a long time if you, if you yourself want to learn the art so that you can be an artist in, in this vein, right? But be confident because the old masters have a lot to teach. And I don't think your study of them will go to waste at all. I don't see any alternative, right? Um, literary revivals like artistic revivals come about when people say, this is historically true, when people say, you know, what we've been doing recently isn't satisfactory anymore. For whatever reason, it's hit a wall. We've gone as far in that vein as we can go. That's played itself out. What do we do now? Well, the answer to that question has always been, oh, let's recover some of the things that people used to do that we have either neglected or forgotten entirely. And then you get your artistic revivals. You get them that way. You get your literary revivals. You reach back behind your immediate predecessors to get, you know, whoever it might be, Milton, that people have forgotten, right? Uh, that's what I would recommend if you yourself want to be an artist in this field. If you want to read poetry, well, I, there are a couple of books I can recommend, but the thing to do is to read poetry, especially stuff written before the 20th century. There's a lot of stuff in the 20th century that is immediately accessible. Read Robert Frost, read Richard Wilbur. Okay? But before the 20th century, poets really did intend to be read by a pretty decent size audience. A fairly broad audience. They meant they read to be understood. They didn't read so that you'd scratch your head and say, "I have no idea what that person just said." They, uh, sorry, they didn't write for, for in that in that way, right? So uh, I mean, go back to them, go back to them, and enjoy them. Take it easy, but enjoy them, right? I hope that helps. Uh, I can name a couple of books. Sure. Yeah. No. Please, please do. What books did you have in mind? A man who was a poet himself and a professor and a raconteur, too. He was on What's My Line for a year or two in the 50s. A guy named Louis Untermeyer wrote a book called Doors to Poetry. Doors or Doorways to Poetry. And he pitched it for high school students. Because already in the 1950s, I think he was seeing that poetry was starting to be neglected. And people thought that it was effeminate. It was incomprehensible. And there's this man who wrote poetry in a lot of the old forms who really loved poetry. And he just, he wanted to bring it back to young people. And it's an excellent, excellent book. Anybody can read it. I would recommend it right away for, for you. If, if you say, I'm uncomfortable with poetry, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. That would be a place to go. The other book that's often used as a textbook is called Understanding Poetry by uh, Cleanth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren. And that's more pitched towards uh, high school students and college students. But it's a heck of a good work, and you can learn a lot from it. And my introduction, 40 pages long in The Hundredfold, is meant to help you out, too, to show you some of the things that poets do, why they do them, what effects they have, so that you won't be completely at sea. You won't be lost, right? So I, w I would actually recommend my introduction, too. Sure, sure. I found for me, my relationship with poetry, and I've said this before on the show, has been changed dramatically very recently to where I'm no longer intimidated by it. And, and that is simply a result of hearing them read out loud, hearing great poems 
read out loud rather than reading them because I find that that when I hear them read out loud, it's a sensory experience and I'm not worrying about whether I understand it well enough. And that is actually a result of a podcast hosted by David Kern. Oh, he's terrific. Yeah, called The Daily Poem. I'm hoping to have him on The Daily Poem where it's just five days a week. He reads a poem. He spends three or four minutes talking about it and then he reads it again. And within just listening to a few of those, it was like, okay, I, I enjoy yeah, poetry now. Yeah. <laughs> and that really well, was it. Poets did meant did mean in the old days they meant to be read aloud so that you would hear the poem. Your first experience of a poem might be to hear somebody read it. And so they composed with the ear always in mind, right? They did not compose their poems so that it would appear in such and such a way on a page. They composed it so that it would sound in such and such a way to the human ear, right? This is especially true of dramatic monologues. They, 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 you are meant to hear a person speaking to you from a dramatic situation. You want me to read one of these? Sure, yeah. If you could maybe read the, the first one. The first one is simply called The Mother. And this is Mary speaking. Okay? And everybody will have to forgive me, my bass voice. I can't do a woman's soprano, but you'll just have to imagine, right? It is the time. It is the blessed time. Now in the secret of our dwelling place, I will unlock the treasure of my heart. And through a little opening in the thatch, I see, or think I see, the dome of night turning to that deep blue I love so well and never find among the things of earth, the blessed time. I will not stir the pool of peace about us. Soon the hour will come, lances of daylight will be slanting in. And even now from the gray hills, I hear something, a sigh, a ripple of the wind, a lamb bleeding for mama, while the boy, sleepy and shambling, leads them from their forage down to the wells to drink. And caravans, Shuffle along the dusty road somewhere, merchants and camels with the bags of coin shifting and clinking while the master nods, a day's journey away, a month, a year. And soldiers grumble softly as they march, and they too, all so many, going somewhere, somewhere, and each of them a mother's son. So is the world to me in this hour's hush, soft as the flicker of a dragonfly folding her blue wings on the windowsill. I think sometimes if I could catch my breath and knit my soul all up into one prayer, one love longing that has no word to tell it, the sun for Joshua would rest still again and morning yield to this sweet hour of peace. I look upon him where he lies asleep, as if his limbs had drunk deep of the night, weary with labor and day and men my son. And see, he shrugged the linen from his shoulder, and in this chilly night, I should go over on tiptoe like a cat to put it right, but then he'd only mutter in his dream, turn to the wall and tug the whole thing under. And what good then? I know his ways. Let be. When he was but a little wriggling boy, he'd sprawl and struggle in dreams, as if he'd climb the brow of rocks heaped at the village side working his hands and clenching with his toes. Till the next time I glanced his way, he had thrown all of the linen to the floor and lay naked, suddenly still, as still as stone. Poor child. Some women dote upon their sons. I see it and say nothing. They send wine to help the priest remember which tall lad snubbed that dog in his den, the publican. Send wafers baked in honey for the scribe teaching a boy with eyes for hunting wolves, how the strange signs on a pale stretch of skin spell out the songs the royal psalmist sang, Odul Adonai Kitol. They say mothers have always nudged the sons they love, and sons despise them for it. That may be. What will you do with him? Whom will he marry? Keep your eyes open. That's a woman's work. Oh, I've kept them open all these years longer than they have any notion of. I saw the small boy drawing in the dust. I saw him gazing with great steady eyes while my good husband tapped upon his chisel to shape a block of wood. And I alone saw the tears when the old man breathed his last. 
The years are burrowing softly, gathering, building. I cannot tell what they are building to. All flesh is as a flower of desert grass. It blooms, it spreads its fingers to the sky. And then come the warm sun and the dry wind, a glance, the flower is gone. So say the prophets who speak the truth, but not the whole of it. The flower of the flesh is opening, and their years are gathering here with all their silent weight. If I could sweep the years away like dust and live my little life and love my son, let one day melt into another till the hand falls open and the life God gave returns to dust. The dust that God holds dear because he made it, declared it good. But that is not his will. Here it is yet here, the boys butchered in their mother's arms, the cold night's flight into the desert, years of listening, soldiers grumbling as they marched by the great snake of Egypt. They are here. And Abraham struck dumb on Mount Moriah, his son bearing the wood. The treasure box of Noah here the secret walk of Enoch, our common mother reaching for the fruit. All are here, here still, gathering, building here, here in the deep blue hour before the dawn. They press upon my heart. They take and press. Look at that knuckle on his right hand, crushed under a beam that slipped out of its harness when they were hoisting it to be a lintel for the old desert fox we call our king. The other workmen said it sheared the flesh down to the bone. When he came home that night and cleaned away the clots of dust and blood, the vein opened again. And for one moment I thought, this is the suffering, this, no more. He read my thought and glanced as if to say, you do know I must be about such business, and seemed to smile a moment with his eyes. We sat and ate, and all the years were here. But Lord, why could it not be only so? Many a time I thought it well enough that he should sweat under the silent sun, yoked like an ox to men who take no thought but where to find a harlot and get drunk, to kill another night with neither love nor heartache, neither peace nor zeal to fight, but only a grunting on from sleep to sleep. Though they do fail at that, poor souls, they fail. He labors with such men. They know his name. They praise his craft. They share the wine and bread, but not one hand to share his solitude. The heart most open is the most alone. Must it be so, dear Lord? Now I recall long years ago, he had a friend he took roaming about the hills as boys will do, searching for agate stones or eagles' nests or gullies running with the rains of spring. Oh, I can see them, leaping from rock to rock, laughing and turning ruddy as the cedar. Then this Johannan would come home with him, and they would talk for hours into the night about who knows how they would climb Mount Hermon when the snow dust his shoulders. Then my son knelt as his father taught him, sang the psalm, upon my bed I meditate thy laws, and all was sudden silence but the friends of childhood are like lilies of the field. And I, on that crisp night, I felt no pain. The warm breath of the oxen rose like smoke. The hay was mild and musty, and men came tugging their wraps about their shoulders, telling of song and wonder. It was like a dream, and my poor husband slumped against his staff, lost to the world, it seemed, but ever listening. No pain bringing my firstborn to the light. The labor has come after. Day by day, year after year, I give him up to a world that will not love him, cannot hate him, must struggle to keep him shut up in the womb, stillborn. They say that goodness has a grace to steal men's hearts before they feel the theft, but men lie. They would have it locked and safe not like the Holy One upon his throne, girt round with thunder. I must give and give to man the ungrateful, this my firstborn son. Give even to those who would be Herods, if they sinned with all their heart and mind and strength. I see it, and he will not pity me. Will have the gift irrevocable and pure. My son, why have you done this to us? 
See, your father and I have searched for you in sorrow. It was a presage of these days. His kindness to me, too, is sweet and sad, as when he cups my cheek with his man's palm, and with a kiss and hardly a word, he goes to the hills days on end, always the hills. He'll say he goes to find just the right cedar for this man's doorpost or that woman's chest, red as a heart, sound and sweet and true. Certain it is he will return with wood that takes its shape like clay in his wise hands. I say, Menachem has some cedar beams. Take what you need from him. Come home tonight. And he will brush this gray strand on my forehead, smile with his eyes, and go into the hills. Sometimes an old gray dog will follow him. Nobody's dog, a bag of bones and scurf who lives on rats and the scraps the boys throw in as he climbs on from bare rock to bare rock away from men, from us. Men like him. Well, they swear more mildly and set down their wine when he draws near them. I see everything to share their meals and listen to their stories. Rarely will he begin to speak and tell of happenings in a world that is not here. Or if it is, it waits like a wild beast with bright and fearsome eyes. Then they fall silent like dogs wrapped by the flickerings of a fire. None of them knows him. Oh, I see it all. He cannot be among us for so long. The old man in the temple warned me of it. Man's love. How is it different from his hate? The wealthiest man in Nazareth has one son who wins goodwill. So gentle is his speech, his shoulder slender and his chin still clean. Whom the girls drawing water at the well tell their shy tales of once he passes by. This lad, whom many a lame old man might fear to bring into a home with wife and daughter, is welcome, but they watch him as they walk. He has kept the commandments from his childhood. Though perseverance is another matter, the man often proves weaker than the boy. One spring it was when the fig blooms and doves are brooding in the secrets of the rock. He called on us, this Elihu, a beam atop his father's granary had given way, and wise and honest hands should see to it before the rains fell. But it wasn't so. One peg had worked its way a little loose, so my son braced the beam and bored new holes to fit another peg, and that was that. But still the boy came calling. Mice had chewed holes in the wall. A plank had warped. His father wanted a stouter beam to bar the door from robbers. Some. And one time, we were at supper when he came. We made room for him at the table, a plain meal of bread and cheese and lentils with some wine, neighborly fare, and he glanced to the door, taken off guard, but he could not be rude, not when he saw our eyes. He sat and ate sparingly, breaking silence now and then with small talk of the Romans, the new man governing in Jerusalem, their legions marching through Israel to Persepolis, or from Persepolis to Israel, I can't. Divisions in the priesthood, relaxers of the law to lend the people ease for bad times, and those who would bind fast, even the tenth part of the cumin weed sprung on the shady side of an old barn. Yet every feint at conversation ended with something like a question, never asked, what shall I do to gain eternal life? But my son knew. So one day he set out, climbing into the mountain wilderness with this young prince of Israel there to pray much and speak little, nothing but the arch of the blue heavens between them and the Lord, who set it on the pillars of the world, and no sound but an eagle's cry far off, and the air whispering. That night the young man came back alone and would not meet my eyes. No, not to this day, though my mother heart goes out to plead with him. This is our life. Whether of joy or sorrow, I can't tell or both so grown together as to be a new thing in the world. If only so. Still the skies whiten and the pitiless sun rises to look on man and all his works. Though all the prayer for peace in that blue hour before the full day can prevail to hold the light below. God wills it. It must come. The spirit beckons. I shall be raised up to a tremendous height of sorrow and joy. The sorrow drawing nearer building, heaping, 
mountains of human sorrow, ages of sin, years of poor mothers weeping at the graves of their lost children, agony of childbirth drying into the bitterness of age, then cracking open, bleeding afresh, the sorrow of sin and death, the long years drought of love and famine in the land, ages of dust settling and building. It must come as surely as the sun rises. I must be poured out in sorrow, and all the sorrow of the world must pour like cataracts upon me. What form it must take is in the hands of God. Even now my heart with all her treasure swells to bursting, and the posts of our sweet life tremble under the weight of what draws near. I feel it like a joy that breaks the heart, a joy that looms over the staring earth, mountains of glory, and what shall man do then? Again, the break of morning. He awakes. Beautiful piece. Thank you for reading that. Uh, thank you for uh, putting up with it. I hope it wasn't too long. No, no, it's it's great. I love the description of Jesus just as a man in society. And when people imagine the, the hidden life of Christ, they imagine him with Mary. They imagine him as a child, a young man uh, learning his trade from from St. Joseph, but not so much just his life among the people and the kind of strangeness and uh, aloneness of that, the, the strange ways that people would find to respond to him before he had started his public mission. Right. What would you, um, Jesus, Jesus worked construction work, right? That's the kind of carpentry we think that he did. So you are hired to help out on a big construction project by a Roman or by Herod Antipas, whatever. And you have to work among other men. How would they have dealt with Jesus? What would they have said to him? What would they have thought of him? He was a man without sin, working every day among men, construction workers who would swear not be faithful, perhaps, to their wives, get drunk, sometimes be irresponsible, but yet yet still with a kind of childlike innocence because human beings are so foolish, really. What would they have made of Jesus? Would they have liked him? Would they have been wary of him? Would they have changed their behavior a little bit when he was near? What kinds of stories might he tell them? I mean, these are the questions that I asked myself. I can't imagine the Jesus that we know from Scripture was always entirely comfortable to be around, right? Everyone's drawn to him, but he makes people uncomfortable at the same time. They don't know what to make of him, right? Who is this man? Who do men say that I am, says Jesus to his disciples. They hardly have any good answers themselves. What must it have been like for Jesus during those years when he was with Mary, without Joseph, before the ministry, and he's a grown man, you know? Well, I tried my best at imagining. And you wonder, you know, he, he must have made himself, he was certainly less conspicuous in his, his difference from everybody else before he began his public ministry, but I mean, I mean that, that must have been the case, that, you know, otherwise people wouldn't have thought of him as simply, you know, perhaps you know, just a, a person from our the hometown son. later on when he comes back. but Right. He wasn't performing miracles. Right. But Mary, she's aware. She had to have always been aware of the abyss of difference between Jesus and the rest of us sinners. And the mother is protective of her son. She must have remembered. St. Luke says that she did. The words of Simeon, uh, a sword shall pierce your heart. You will be raised up as a sign of contradiction. The rise and fall of many in Israel will be marked by him. She's never forgotten that. And she's wondering, what sword is it going to be? Right? Whatever sword it's going to be, it's going to be a sword that comes from her son and his suffering. Well, isn't it enough that he should live in the flesh among sinners? not be appreciated by them, not even understood or loved? Isn't that enough? Does it have to be more? Couldn't things just stay the way they are now? 
isn't it enough that God should become a finite being at all? Right, right. Even if he were decked with glory on earth, it would still be a humbling of himself. Right. And it's as if she is praying to keep the sun from rising, because the time of day that the poem is set in is that 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 strange and beautiful and, and solemn twilight before dawn, when the sky is that very, very deep blue that is not the dark of night, but it's not the blue of day either. And she says, uh, it's that deep blue I love so well and never find among the things of earth. If only it could stay right now. But no, it can't. That the years are building. Human sin is heaping up. The sorrow is coming. God wills it. It must come. The sun must rise. Yeah. He must awake. And at the end of the poem, she says he awakes. Yeah, it's a really beautiful piece, and it's a great first monologue in the book. That's right. It's the first of 12. Yeah. How did you approach the, we're not reading it in this interview, but how did you approach the St. Peter monologue? It's it's very overwhelming. <laughs> it's very intense. Yeah. Well, again, my man in all of this is Robert Browning, the great master of dramatic monologue. And he was able to put himself in a dramatic situation and almost empty himself of himself and become the character. It's as if Browning the poet disappears into the character. He was phenomenal at that. He was as good as anybody ever was at that. Shakespeare, he was as, when it comes to that lone thing, that one thing, he was as good as Shakespeare was at his best, Browning at his best. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do always. And in this one, I said, okay, he's St. Peter, he's denied Christ, Christ is on the cross, he's not even dead yet, right? And Peter is bitterly weeping. How do the words go in that man's head? And one of the things I had to make sure of is that that you don't even get a period in this poem. You don't even get a complete sentence until the poem is about three quarters of the way through. It's all agony stream of consciousness. It doesn't mean it's incomprehensible. It means that it's the kind of thing that you experience in your own mind when you're accusing yourself. You don't you, you don't stop for so to speak, you don't stop to put a period at the end of your sentence and think, okay, now there's the next sentence. It's, a, it's, it's a one stream of self-condemnation, a stream of memories, stream of, of all kinds of scenes from his past that come back to him. When he said, depart from me, I am an evil man. That's, that's the first line of my monologue. But that's the scene when, you know, Jesus says to him, why don't you put out further into the deep there uh, after he, Peter has, has caught nothing all night long. And Peter must have been irritated by that. Who's this, who's this guy telling me I'm a professional fisherman? Who's me telling me what to do? But he does anyway. And, and they catch so many fish, the nets, the nets are full to bursting. And when he puts in at the shore, he says to Jesus, Lord, depart from me. I am an evil man. That scene comes back to Peter now. Depart from me. I am an evil man. Depart from me. I am an evil man. The scene where he says, I say you are the son of Christ, the son of the living God. That comes back to him. His boastfulness comes back to him when he was at the Last Supper. Even if all these others should leave you, I will never leave you. I will never leave you. Right. The scene at the top of the Mount of Transfiguration comes back to him. All these things come back to him, making him feel worse and worse, stupider and stupider. That's got to have been what it was like, I think. I mean, that's my imagination. What would... How would I be if I were in his shoes? That's what I would be. Even my so-called triumphs would come back at me in shame. You know, I, yeah. uh, I was the rock, right? I'm such a rock. Look at me. Sure. Yeah. Well, we, we have been in those shoes. You know, that's why it's, it's a very wrenching poem, because it really, I've been there, you know? Yeah, we've all been there. It's the sixth monologue. And with that monologue, uh, draws near to its close the first half of my poem. The middle of the poem is, the whole middle of the poem is centered around the passion, uh, the death and resurrection of Christ. So everything that happens after the middle of the poem is after the resurrection. So the seventh monologue on the other side 
is spoken by the demoniac that Jesus healed. And I make him be present at these events. Right. He's a kind of mis- mysterious character. Yeah, he's a very mysterious character. I make him present. I make him present to overhear what Peter does. Nobody notices the ex-demoniac from Gadara. And so he moves among people uh, almost as a ghost. But he sees a lot more than what they see because he used to be insane and possessed by that. What's interesting about his perspective is it's, it seems very objective. Like he's definitely not judging Peter from what I recall. It, it, right. no, he, he just sees not. things clearly and he's almost like he's been through so much that he's very matter of fact and calm about all the, the crazy stuff that he's perceiving. That's right. And, and he still, he is able to perceive terrifying things in the spiritual world. Still, it's as if he's, he was possessed by demons, but the experiences have not left him. And they have given him now that he is healed, a keen insight into the demonic and the angelic. He hears new resurrection and he knows that he will see the face of Christ. Yeah, fascinating. I wanted to ask a question going back to the mother monologue. What's the deal with Elihu, that young man who keeps coming to see them? Yeah, let's suppose that somebody like the rich young prince who appears later in the Gospels and to ask Jesus, what shall I do to gain eternal life? Let's suppose that somebody like that shows up at Jesus's house in Nazareth, you know, the son of a rich neighbor. and. Uh, He sees something in Jesus that others haven't really quite seen. So he's drawn to Jesus. He's embarrassed about it. He's drawn there. Finally, he blurts out the question why he really wants to know Jesus, because he wants to know the secret. What shall I do to gain eternal life? And whatever Jesus says to him as they go forth that day into the mountains, whatever he says, it is a source of dismay. And after that time, this this fellow will not come back, right? The answer was, well, I mean, we know that the young man went away sad in the Gospels. I imagine a similar thing happening earlier in Jesus's life, and that Mary is is a kind of a third party witness to it. She knows something of it. She doesn't know what conversation they had, but whatever they had, uh, it wasn't something that the young man wanted to hear, maybe a sacrifice too great for him to make. And he walked away sad, though her mother's heart still goes out to him. And we we don't know what will happen with that. I, I named him Elihu after the young man who appears at the end of Job, the, the sort of brash young man. Maybe this young man is similar in that way. Maybe he thought he was a lot farther along the path to eternal life than he really was. You have a couple of other fun monologues that where you get to use your classical knowledge a little bit, where you have a letter from Pontius Pilate years after the crucifixion to the Emperor Claudius, and then you've also got towards the very end a dialogue uh, or or a monologue of it's it's two friends of man and lovers of their country. I, th- I think that's the yeah, title of it. Right. And, you, yeah. and you've got it. I think it's a Jewish man speaking to a, what is it, a Roman a Stoic? Greek. Yeah. A Romanized Greek who's a Stoic. And, who um, wants, and they're very, who wants they're very, the they're very entertaining. Yeah. I'm actually quite pleased with how the Pontius Pilate letter came out. It, it's many years later. He is writing from Spain. The, the charge of his cruelty has followed him to Spain. He has rivals there that have slandered him before the emperor. He says they've slandered him. So he writes to clear his name. He is insolent. The crucifixion of of Jesus has never left his mind. He's never gotten over it. It's clear. I mean, it's though he does not directly talk to Claudius about this. Okay. Claudius has been let to given to know that Pilate's wife has been hanging around with one of these rabble, the Christians, right? Because we remember Pilate's wife said, I had a dream about this man. He's a just man. Don't, don't do anything to him, right? And Pilate 
let that matter fall out of his hands. You know, he washed his hands of it. He had Christ crucified. I imagine the wife many years later, still interested. And Pilate, estranged, partly estranged from his own wife, sick to death of the whole Roman Empire, insolent to Claudius, not knowing where to turn, the Pilate who has asked, what is truth, right? You know, we don't really know what's going to happen to this man after the end of, of his letter. He says to Claudius at the end, I'm not going to write the ending, right? We don't know. We don't know. I imagine a, a lot of prayer is involved in the writing of a work such as this, just by its nature. Yeah. Years of listening to Mass, of reading Scripture and prayer, and many of the poems are prayers. Many of the lyric poems have the structure of prayers. Not all of them, but many of them do. And all, of course, all of the hymns are. The St. Peter's whole monologue is a prayer. Right. He's always addressing the Lord. Depart from me, I am an evil man. By the end, he's saying, oh, Lord, do not listen to me. Do not depart from me. Whatever you do, don't depart from me. Right? You know, it was a wonderful thing when, when Christians were poets and poets were Christians. We need to get some of that back because the secular people don't have any. They don't know what to do with poetry anymore. It doesn't really sing for them. What do they have to sing about? Who do they have to sing to? So it's become a shriveled up, a dry, shriveled up little thing. Well, it's time for people of faith to say to the Lord, hey, Lord, look at this valley full of dry bones. We can't make them live, but uh, you can make them live. So, Lord. Let these dry bones live again. Would you like to close with another lyric poem of your choosing? Well, I'd like to close with the hymn, if I might. Okay, great. Okay, so this is the central hymn in the whole work. It's in eight stanzas, because eight is the number of the resurrection. Christ rose on the day after. What melody is it set to? Right. It is to be sung to the melody of Ye, ye Sons and Daughters, Ophelia Filiae. It's written in rhyming triplets with an alleluia at the end of each. So this is the central hymn. It's the central poem in the whole work, too. As watchmen longing for the light, let us sing out and so make bright the silence of this blessed night. Alleluia. This is the night the conquering Lord spoke and the powers of darkness heard and fled in terror from his word. Alleluia. This night the hosts of Israel came safe through the sea to Pharaoh's shame, their shield the fearful shaft of flame. Alleluia. Upon the long imprisoned band, a light has shone at his command, whom hell's dark gates cannot withstand. Alleluia. From death the radiant Christ awakes, upon the east his glory breaks, the earth to her foundation shakes. Alleluia. The stone is shaken from the tomb. So also on the day of doom, when Christ our morning star shall come. Alleluia. Then in thy grace roll back the stone. Unseal our hearts and claim thine own, that we may sh shine before thy throne. Alleluia. Darkness forever melts away, and saints sing out in bright array this first and last and only day. Alleluia. Great. Well, uh, Tony, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I definitely would recommend people check out The Hundredfold. So thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you, Tom. It's, it's been a pleasure for me, and, and I hope people, you know, not be afraid. Be not afraid of poetry. It's, it's our art. We should take it back. Mm -hmm.